Income tax 2022-2023, other income part number one. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Most of this information comes from the Form 1040 Instructions Tax Year 2022 Instructions for Schedule 1, Additional Income and Adjustments to Income. You can find it on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at our income tax formula, we're focused once again, line one, income. Remembering that the income tax formula, the first half of it, in essence, is an income statement, although a strange one where we have income minus the equivalent of the expenses, those being the deductions gets us to the equivalent of net income, this being the taxable income, everything's flipped on its head. We want the taxable income as low as possible as opposed to in normal circumstances, net income, which we usually want as high as possible. That means with the income line we're focused on, we need to determine if something is classified as income and whether or not is it's exempt income with regards to recording it for taxes. That's the general concept. Looking at the first page of the form 1040, we're focused down here, line number eight, other income from schedule one. If we look at Schedule 1, this is the additional uh, income and adjustments to income. We're now down here on line number 8, where we have these other somewhat kind of random items, and we're going to go through some of these items. They're not quite as common, which is why they're kind of all grouped up into the other income down below. The net operating loss, the gambling, uh, the cancellation of debt, and so on and so forth. So let's look at them lines by lines and list some of them out and then we'll take a look at some of them in the tax software. Tracking software? Lines 8A through 8Z are the other income lines. Now remember the general rule from the tax code perspective is everything from the IRS perspective that you receive is kind of like income unless it's exempt from income, classified as not income. So you can get very creative and start saying, well, what if this happened? What if that happened? I've got, I got money because of this or that and the other thing. Well, those might fall into this line, <laughs> which would be the other income uh, type of situation. So caution, do not report on lines 8A through 8Z any income from self-employment or fees received as a notary republic. Instead, you must use Schedule C even if you don't have any business expenses. Also, don't report on lines 8A through 8Z any non-employee compensation shown on Form 1099 Miscellaneous, 1099 NEC, 1099K, unless it isn't itself uh, self-employment income, such as income from a hobby or a um, sporadic activity. Now, this is really important to understand. Why is that the case? Why would I need to be reporting something on a Schedule C or why when I get a Form 1099 miscellaneous or 1099 NEC or 1099K is the IRS expecting to see in essence a Schedule C and not something reported on this other income line because we have the self-employment tax that's gonna be coming into play here. So note that we're talking about income taxes as the primary focus when we look at the Form 1040 but if you have W-2 wages, the W-2 also reflects the Social Security and Medicare that was taken out. And usually it's done already. You don't have to really do anything extra if it's W-2 wages because the IRS got the employer to handle that on the tax side. So it's just a reporting thing. But if you're self-employed, then the IRS is going to say, if you have self-employment income, we want to treat you as both the employee and employer. Therefore, the 1040 is not only going to be used to calculate your income tax, but also the employee-employer portion equivalent, that being the self-employment tax, Social Security and Medicare, which can be quite significant. So that means that if you have some income that's classified as business income, the IRS is going to want a piece of it, not just for income taxes, but also for the Social Security and uh, Medicare components of it. 
So then you can get into classifications. Should it be a hobby income or should it be self-employment? You can get into questions as to whether something is self-employment income. If you get a 1099 miscellaneous or something like that, or, or an NEC or K, then the IRS would generally assume you would think that it's going to be self-employment income. They would expect to see a Schedule C unless you claim it's a hobby. So if it's and the reason the IRS will allow people to take a hobby is because obviously they don't want people to be able to take losses. So if you had Schedule C income from a 1099 and you had more expenses than income, then you can end up with a loss which is actually good for taxes, right? Because then you might be able to write that off against the W-2 uh, wages, which the IRS doesn't want to see, right? So they're going to say, if you had income, then they're going to try to hit you with self-employment tax as well as uh, uh, other income. And if it's a hobby, uh, and that's why you got one of these 1099s, then that's when the exception might you know, apply. So just general rule to keep that in mind. Instead, see the instructions for the recipient uh, included on form 1099 miscellaneous, 1099 NEC, 1099K. So you can always look at those forms for more instructions to find out where to report the income. So for more information about what is being reported on form 1099K, see instructions for payee included on that form and you can visit irs.gov forward slash gig work. The 1099K, in other words, is kind of like a newer type of form where the IRS is trying to pressure in non-traditional kind of formats. In every transaction, usually you have a payer and a, and a payee, meaning you have someone generating income from the transaction and someone that is paying, which would have an expense or deduction if they were a business for taxes. But with this gig economy situation, because the end user uh, is, is really a, an individual, the IRS has less leverage over them. So they started to, to work on uh, forcing not only the payer of a business situation, but trying to get the intermediary platforms like the gig economy platforms or the, the credit card companies and PayPal's of the world and whatnot, and try to pressure them to issue these 1099K forms. Okay, so line 8A, net operating loss NOL deduction. Enter on line 8A any NOL deduction from an earlier year. Enter the amount in the pre-printed parentheses as a negative number. The amount of your deduction will be subtracted from the other amounts of income listed on lines uh, 8B through 8Z. Public, you can see publication 536 for more details. So if we have a net operating loss, we talked about losses a bit, meaning that like if you had a Schedule C, for example, and you had more expenses than income that's quite common for startup type of businesses the irs is going to be quite skeptical of losses because what what does the irs want they want you to make income so they could take part of it right if you have a loss they don't want to take they don't want to take on the risk of your business losses they just want the benefit of the business gains right so they're going to be skeptical of the losses so it's possible that you can write off uh, the losses because you would think that in a startup business that you should get some tax benefit for the losses because that's your investment that was necessary in order to in increase income in future years. So, so then th they might limit the losses, right? If they limit the losses, then you got to see, okay, is there some way I can get a tax benefit from the losses that were, that were limited, possibly carrying them forward. If you have a situation where there's losses being carried forward or something like that, that's more complex from a tax preparation standpoint. So you're going to want to most likely, anytime there's more complex situation, I would take the tax return from the prior year if I had a new client and enter that into the prior year software so I can roll over all the information from the prior year software so that the, the rollover of the losses if will properly roll over as well and hopefully be populated properly in the system. If you have a continuing client, then again, the software is quite useful if you're using the same software can help you to kind of analyze what the software is doing with the rollover and then see if it's an appropriate, appropriate thing and explain it to a client as well as yourself. So line 8B, gambling. So enter line 8B, any gambling winnings. Gambling winnings include lotteries, raffles, a lump sum payment from the sale of a right to receive future lottery payments, etc. For details on gambling losses, see the instructions for Schedule A, line 16. So gambling is often one of those areas where people have questions, right? They're going to say, like, if, the, if you have a someone that gambles a lot, like it's just like their hobby, 
then they're pretty aware most likely of the rules related to gambling which is basically the the winnings that you're going to get if they're over a certain amount once again the government will often pressure say a casino or the horse track or whatever to uh, give give a give documentation of the income and so they're going to have the income then that you're you're generally going to have to report uh, and then I, on the on the can I deduct something? Well, usually most gamblers aren't going to say it's a Schedule C business because it's not their main business or anything like that. So you don't really have the losses there. So the only other place you might be able to deduct losses would be on the Schedule A. But the losses are severely limited to be able to deduct, unlike they would be if it was like a business, because first you have to be able to itemize to take the deductions, and most people don't itemize. And then, and then also you're limited to taking the losses up to the amount of the gambling uh, winnings. So you don't have this situation where you can have more losses than winnings, which would be like subsidizing, you know, a gambling habit or hobby. So that kind of uh, makes sense. So the losses are, are severely limited to how much you could take opposed to the winnings. Obviously, if you deal with non-gamblers that went to a casino and they just won a car or something like they just won a prize all of a sudden, they are often hit suddenly with the fact that they've got this big win and that could have a significant impact on their on their taxes because of the progressive tax system if they take all of that windfall profit you know all that big gain in one year then it's going to increase their tax rates and oftentimes if it's a physical thing like a car they got or even if it's money they spend it all and they don't realize the tax bill that's also why you might end up with situations where if they give you an annuity or if they can pay it out over a long period of time, you know, into the future or have a lump sum today, there's a couple things to take into consideration. One is the time value of money. So, and so obviously a lump sum today is worth more than an annuity that if they were for the same total dollar amount. But also there's a tax implication because if you get this big hit in one tax year, then your 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 taxable rates will go up as well whereas if you were to get less money over a longer period of time then you might have lower tax brackets but in any case tip, tip. attach forms w2g to form 1040 or 1040 sr if any federal income tax was withheld so note that's another thing that if you got like winnings like a lottery or something and you got a w2g reporting those winnings you might want to have withholdings out of the winnings most people don't do that oftentimes because they don't they're not really thinking of taxes because taxes is one of those things that's kind of in the back of most people's minds that's just being taken care of with their employee employer situation the employer is responsible for my taxes right i filled out the but but obviously if you have a win like windfall profit or gains of some kind big hit like a win in the lottery that's going to have a tax implication you might want to withhold on it line 8c cancellation of debt so enter on line 8C, any cancellation of debt, canceled debt may be shown in box two of form 1099C. However, part or all of your income from cancellation of debt may be non-taxable. You can see publication 4681 or go to irs.gov and enter canceled debt or foreclosure in the search box. Now, cancellation of debt is a strange one because most of the time you'd say, well, why would someone cancel a debt? Like if I had a debt with the bank, like mortgage, for example, I owed them a loan back, then it, it would be strange for them to cancel the debt, right? If they cancel the debt, you would think that they would do that only because they didn't think that they were going to get paid from us. So they're going to cancel the debt. What happens if they cancel the debt? Well, generally, you would call it income, right? Like because that would be the equivalent if they cancel the debt of them giving you money or some and then you paying it back to them to pay down the debt. So you basically kind of got money that paid down the, your debt obligations that are owed, which would be a taxable event. Now, the funny, the, the issue thing there is that most of the time when there's a cancellation of debt issue, it's because someone is in a financial hardship situation. That's what drove the bank to cancel the debt because they knew they weren't going to get paid anyways. So, so then you've got a situation where... Uh, maybe the tax code will be lenient in certain situations. And we saw some with the COVID, the PPP loans is a strange situation with the cancellation of debt kind of situation that was going on with that. And then uh, if people are in insolvent situations, there could be areas where the, where the 
the normal kind of income from the cancellation of debt would possibly not have to be an included as income so there could be exceptions to the general rule so the general rule makes sense if someone cancels the debt you owed them money now they say that you don't owe them money then they basically gave you money right that you you got income and like paid off the debt so it should be income but because most people are in financial hardships there could be many exceptions for the irs to say that that income is exempt from income for whatever reasons line 8d foreign earned income exclusion and housing inclusion uh, from form 2555 enter the amount of your foreign earned income and housing in inclusion from form 2555 2555 line 45 now obviously when you get into to foreign people that have foreign income uh, it gets a, a little bit confusing because depending on where the foreign income is coming from there's going to be agreements of course between the irs and and possibly other countries so that you don't end up with like uh, an, an unfair kind of double taxing uh, type of situation and that is also kind of a specialty area if you are doing uh, taxes then do you want to be working on taxes that are going to be more complex in the area possibly of people that have uh, income from multiple places multiple states makes it a little bit more complicated as well as uh, multiple countries make things uh, more complicated or do you want to specialize if you're doing taxes on more more uh, places for a single location possibly specialize in a certain state or and or a certain country which would make things a little bit easier possibly you could you know you could find tax software that might be a little bit cheaper if it doesn't have to deal with like rules for multiple states in multiple uh, countries and whatnot and so that's just something to keep in mind or you might specialize like by industry and that kind of stuff so which again the industry codes or the, the tendencies of businesses within different states even might be different given the rules for different states as well so in any case uh, enter the amount of the pre-printed parentheses as a negative number. The amount from form 2555, line 45, will be subtracted from the other amounts of income listed on lines 8A uh, through 8C and lines 8E through 8Z. Complete the foreign earned income tax worksheet if you enter an amount on form 2555, line 45, foreign earned income exclusion and housing exclusion uh, from form 2555 so you might look at that form and the instructions for that if you want to dive down into more detail with it line 8e income from form 8853 enter on line 8e the total of the amounts from form 8853 lines 8 12 and 26 you can see publication 969 for more detail there on the irs website of course caution you may have to pay an additional tax if you received a taxable distribution from an archer msa or medicare advantage msa so another kind of specialty area we might touch on a little bit more in future presentations but you could see the instructions for form 8853 for more detail there line 8f income from form 8889 enter on line 8f the total of the amounts uh, from form 8889 line 19 to 20. so again you could we might be able to look at the instructions if you want to dive down on that more of the form uh, 8889 caution you may have to pay an additional tax if you received a taxable distribution from a health savings account you can see instructions for form 8889 for more detail there line 8h jury duty pay also see instructions for line 24a so there's you know different kind of rules on the jury duty if you got reimbursed and whatnot and all that kind of stuff usually it's a fairly small amount that someone's going to get paid for for jury duty so it's not usually like a really uh material tax different oft, oftentimes for most people but depending on, on the earnings it could be so line 8i prizes and awards enterprises and awards but see the instructions for line 8m olympic and paralympic uh, medals and usoc prize money later so this is you know similar to to you know the winnings kind of thing now you've got money you've, you've received prizes so and awards for something that was done and again from the irs perspective if you've got a prize or award everything is basically income unless they say they say otherwise and if you think if you earned the prize 
then you, you would think it would be kind of like earned income for the most part, unless there's some kind of uh, uh, exception related to it. So line 8J, activity not entered in for profit. Profit. But income, so it's not uh, a for, you, you entered into an activity that's not for profit. So remember we talked before about the idea that if it is a for profit thing, if, if then you're gonna wanna have to put it on the schedule C or something like that, because, because uh, if it's business income, you have to pay social security and Medicare. So that's a big deal because that's a, that's a big difference. And whereas if it's not uh, a for-profit activity, then possibly you can put the in income somewhere on uh, the other income section. And that's where it's usually not gonna be subject. You're not gonna be calculating the social security and Medicare on it oftentimes. So line 8K stock options, enter on line 8K, any income from the excess of stock options not otherwise reported on form 1040 or 1040SR, line uh, 1H, line 8I, income from the rental of personal property if you engaged in the rental for profit, but were not in the business of renting such property, profit or property. <laughs> You can also see the instructions for more detail on that on line 24B later. You got line 8M, Olympic and para, uh, Paralympic uh, medals and USOC prize money, the value of Olympic and Paralympic medals and the amount of United States Olympic Committee USOC prize money you receive on account of your participation in the Olympic or Paralympic games may be non-taxable. So I haven't personally had a situation where I had a client that was uh, was good enough of, of an athlete uh, to do that. But if you do, if you if you find one, if you or, or yourself are that good, then then you might have a tax exemption benefit from it. So these amounts should be reported to you in box three of form 1099 miscellaneous to see if these amounts are taxable. First figure your adjustment gross income, uh, including the amounts of your medals and prize money. So I think that's good because we need that we need to be number one in the in the Olympics and Paralympics and everything. So whatever, here we go. If your adjusted gross income is not more than a one million dollars, five hundred thousand, if married filing separately, these amounts are non-taxable, and you should include the amount in box three of Form 1099 Miscellaneous Online 8M, then subtract it by including it on line 24C. So you've got this similar kind of situation where you're gonna say, okay, now you've got a form saying that you've got income. If it's exempt from income, you're gonna show it to the IRS on the line and then subtract it, it's telling the IRS there's an exemption happening. And this is a common practice, even though this situation might not show up itself, it's a common kind of concept to do that. You've got the tax form, the IRS has the tax form. You wanna make sure that your number ties in to what the IRS has if you plan on reporting income less than what the 1099 reported and then possibly subtract out and give the rationale as to why you're subtracting out so the IRS can tie their form into the, the top line.